And that was Mr. Dana Lyons, and that's uh, Salmon Come Home off his new album, uh, Coast Salish. And uh, uh, I'll have to get the, all the word I don't have in front of me. I've been running around. Uh, we, uh, if you're just tuning in, we just had a small fire drill, and uh, the fire uh, people told me I can come in, and it's safe to come in. And so we have Chief Phil Lane on the, on the line here with us, and it, it is 5 o'clock, and you're listening to KAOS 89.3 FM here in Olympia, Washington. This is Make No Bones About It and Raven Red Bone. And how you doing, Uncle? Did I got you? How are, how are you? Good. Really good. Yeah. So um, uh, first, uh, thanks for calling us uh, on Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you. And um, Yeah, we're, uh, I just... Uh, well, I was explaining. I just had a little fire drill here, and I'm, I'm so now I think I'm t- calm down a little bit. And uh, <laughs> you know, you got to go through, and I'm like, okay, what do I do? And so I, I, I did what I had to do and got outside, and then I got the okay to come in. And uh, so um, it just goes with everything that's going on out there. I feel like you know the we're at very high state uh, of uh, alert. I think, um, mm-hmm. and I've been reading, you know, a lot about. Uh, Still, the the effects of uh, Fukushima, uh, the radiation, kids dying, and things uh, that are happening in the, and all over. And but I also know that there's so much good that's happening too. And I wanted to talk about that. And uh, um, we have uh, Takaya Blaney that's going to mm-hmm. be, be joining us at 5:30 to to share what's on her heart too. But I just wanted to first, you know, you know let you have a chance to kind of introduce yourself and. We want to talk a little bit about those those things that are happening and how you see it. And again, mm-hmm. um, I've been seeing uh, just to give you kind of a framework for myself. The last two months, uh, just I, I know I talk about the bus a lot, but I take the bus and I see people every day, and mm-hmm. I see people reacting in ways that I've never seen them react before. And mm-hmm. I and I know it's because of uh, all the things that have been happening on the planet right now. And uh, people are feeling um, overwhelmed. And so I want to try to bring them into that prayer, you know, uh, what Uncle Arvo was talking about and yourself and all the other folks uh, all over Turtle Island that are in that prayer. Well, Toshika, first of all, I want to to, uh, wish everybody, including yourself, a happy Father's Day. And especially I want to include all those single parents who are playing both mothers and fathers. Because they should be recognized both on Mother's Day and Father's Day, and they they have a, a incredible incredible uh, role to play in raising the future generations. I want to remember them, not just males today, but also those sisters who are fathers as well as mothers to the children. Or uh, on Mother's Day, those fathers who are single parents, but are fathers and mothers to the children. I think it's very important to remember because. <clears throat> I think this is the core and essence of the future, and that is our children and grandchildren and how we, um, the love and compassion and the care and the wisdom and the, the um, sense of, of how sacred we are that we give to them, that is the future. And so I think we have to really give thanks to not just of fathers, but grandfathers and so forth all the way back. That's the core of it. But I, I, I believe that we're really, really beginning to to move into the inner heart of this change. And uh, I think that what's before us is going to be a, a very profound process. You know, on February 22nd is the Mayan uh, year of what they call destiny. And I believe that... that uh, we're going to see really our destinies begin to really strongly hold. And I, I, I think to set the context, um, uh, to, 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 to see the positive uh, movement forward, we have to see what's happening right today in terms of not only uh, Fukushima, which is, which is way, way a uh, greater problem than being shared with us at this point. There's a huge cover-up there. But as well, I think that very, very, very uh, significantly is what's just unfolding now in Iraq and across the Middle East. I think that this is just a 
uh, just a shattering uh, process that's going on for those royalties there. And to think that um, um, this happened, I mean, really, literally, because of the same coloniz colonization that happened here, that um, here were these borders of, of uh, quote unquote, Iraq and these other Middle Eastern countries, um, really completely uh, marked up by the colonizers there uh, that came in there to that part of the world, particularly the English and French and others. And what happened was, rather than respect, like here, when they made the U.S.-Canadian borders, the U.S.-Mexican borders, respecting the various ethnic and religious uh, 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 peoples, understanding the context, they just built these borders haphazardly to their own economic and political uh, understanding. And in so doing, laid the seeds of what we're seeing today, where, where uh, you know, in, in uh, uh, the second largest city in Iraq, literally, uh, 1,000 of the even more radical uh, Al Qaeda type relatives routed 30,000 uh, U.S. trained Iraqi troops where they just left their their guns behind, their uniform behind, and fled. And there's hundreds of thousands of people on the move. They're very close, uh, and, and this is going to, it's a Baghdad. You've got now Iran saying to the U.S., we're going to work together with you, and let's fight these people. And you've got quietly, the U.S. has just pulled in a big, um, a big uh, battleship, a big uh, aircraft carrier right off the coast there. Uh, this whole group is coming in and taking on Baghdad now and taking on the Sunnis that are taking on the Shiites, the, the, the Sunni uh, extremists. They just came out of Syria. So you see that whole area right now is going up in flames. And it's just the beginning. You know, if, uh, the, the Kurdish relatives just took, took their cut, which is where they have major oil resources. Then the extremists took it back. I mean, it's, it's just a mess. And with it, in Canada, I don't know if you've experienced it there in the United States, all of a sudden gas prices shot up. You know, just just in a day. Again, they, anytime that they can make more money off these off these global crises, of course they do too. And so it's not just a it's a, reason, it's a certain reflection, but it's also a reflection of greed. And I think in the future, when we look back to this time. We're going to have to question why all this instability in in the Middle East which cuts down oil supplies, which now the U.S. is the greatest exporter of oil in the world for the last couple of years. So the, the things are going out of control. I mean, the world has become truly really unmanageable, just like an addict. And, you know, the, the global society, really, if we think about it, is acting like an addict because we are addicted to, um, you know, all this materialism and all these things that we, uh, um, you know, have are sacrificing much most is precious to us as our future generations. At the same time, we have these incredible young generations rising up like this young uh, 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 Takashi that we're going to have coming on, Takaya Blaney, who I had a chance to spend time with uh, here just this last week, and then we'll be together down in California for a global meeting of the of indigenous people from all over the world. And Takayo will be there, and, and uh, as one as a young one of the young leaders there. So I think that that there's no question that there's a tremendous opportunity at this time. So rather than saying, okay, we, we're stopping we're stopping Keystone Cell, and we're stopping Enbridge, and we're stopping uh, Kinder Morgan. I, re I really believe when Stephen Harper, our Prime Minister here in Canada, announces um, within the next 10 days, uh, which I'm, it, it is going to be that they're going to push through this Northern Gateway pipeline, the resistance that's going to rise up is going to be beyond what people expect here. I think the same thing, you know, that President Obama was just on the Standing Rock Reservation in South Dakota, which uh, uh, again, you know, I I don't, want to, I don't want to say too much about that other than to say I know that personally 
that he was delivered by the tribal chairperson there a copy of our international treaty to protect the sacred from tar sands projects, at least the Honkawa Dakota stand, those rosebud stands, and others stand against the Keystone XL. So he was personally delivered that and to his hands. Uh, so we'll see what he does. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, there's no question, uh, and, and we've really been taking a lot of time looking at well, what are the alternatives, because it's true, if all we have to say is no to this, no to this, no to this, we can't provide alternatives, then really, uh, um, you know, we're just saying no, but what's the alternative? Well, it's really, really clear that, for instance, solar energy is, is this energy, at least one of them, is going to be primary in the world here in the next decades. And it, it already is. But it's interesting um, what we're exploring here in Canada is that um, if you look at the price of solar farm, solar farms or solar, solar energy, um, for instance, that's been developed in China due to the fact that the U.S. wouldn't support their own in solar engineers, kind of invested the money in, in, into them. They have the finest cutting-edge solar and the cheapest technology in the world. I'm not saying that by the way that China is doing everything correctly. I, don't think, I think we all, uh, all human humanity has to look at each of our nation states and look at what, what's sustainable and what's not. But at the same time, uh, this solar is so much dramatically cheaper than what the U.S. has or Canada has that the U.S. has put a 249% tariff on Chinese solar. So meaning that they, they, they um, subsidize solar and then they tax and tariff solar and wind farms and any kind of alternative energy. So I believe that First Nations across uh, the Americas particularly and around the world, have a really, really tremendous opportunity now to take leadership. And we just completed the International Indigenous Leadership Gathering up in the Staten Nation, for which Chief Daryl Bob and the chiefs and council of the Staten Nation really greatly, greatly be thanked. Because for six years now, with, with uh, just what they can hunt and what people contribute, they feed everybody who comes to that gathering. I don't care... What color you are, I don't care how old or how young you are, everybody gets fed. Every place has a place to sit. And this year was such a stunning uh, demonstration of what the oneness of humanity looks like. Because there were so many members of the human family right there in that circle. And yet, all these sacred ceremonies took place, and there was not even a flutter that somehow uh, so and so should not be here or this person should not be here. There was peace in that camp. It took six years of prayer, but there was peace. You saw it. what the future has when we truly awaken to the fact that we're all members of the same human family. But to think that here's a people, members of the human family, the great Statlium nation. I talked with one of the chiefs there, and they have plotted all the village areas where the Statlium nation was prior to contact. They now have established there was 300,000 Statlium people there prior to contact. Today, there's 6,000. That means at the lowest point, they're probably maybe down to maybe 1,000, 2,000 people out of 300,000 people. And yet, they have such spiritual strength and such spiritual insight and such spiritual love and compassion that they host everybody that came. Didn't make any difference what color your eyes were. Didn't make any difference if you're tall or short. As long as you came there in a peaceful, respectful way, you were well treated. And it was a it was something to see. So I, I saw that. I know that's possible. Then we had a young man who'd come over from Sudan, uh, and he was treated uh, and given a special recognition place for all the suffering his people have been through. And you had people playing uh, these Tibetan drums singing these Tibetan chants. So beautiful. You know, we had such hand drums going at one time, they would just literally um, uh, shake the whole circle. You know, we had uh, um, 
others sharing a very sacred thing, you know, uh, very sacred bundles that were there, and great healing took place. And so what we're exploring now is that, as you know, here in British Columbia, this land truly is unceded. I mean, it's simply been stolen, as has happened all over the world to indigenous people and many other people throughout history. It's taken. So they have no title except maybe to 7 or 8% that they settled to self-governing nations, which is fine. But so what we're seeing is that we're, we're going to do it. We're not going to ask permission. We're not going to do it. We've got permission now from chiefs here. We're simply going to bring in this solar uh, directly from China, directly to First Nations here and to other First Nations across the United States and Canada, and begin to to generate our own energy and uh, from our own positions, uh, you know, do t tax whatever we need to tax, but develop this incredible uh, uh, grid of power, energy that's needed. But the main thing is that you can see that the reason we're able to begin doing this now is because we have a spiritual foundation. There's nothing that's going to, to um, resolve the issues of humanity basis without a spiritual foundation. Just like we knew, our elders knew, that's why they prophesied these things. They knew when they saw people who had lost their spiritual uh, foundations because of all the abuse they've gone through in Europe, that you cannot build a human being or a nation on greed, on selfishness, on jealousy, on disunity, on cruelty, and abuse. You cannot do it. So they could see knew when they saw this, they knew it was collapsed. They knew eventually, no matter how many guns and how many materialistic powers that people have, in the end you go down. I don't care who you are, I don't care how much money you have, whoever you think you are, unless we humble ourselves before the Creator, we all go to the same place. And that's it, back to Mother Earth. In a short time. So that's kind of some of my initial um, comments that are just coming out of my heart. Uh, you know, I don't want to make judgments here. I think that we all have to check our own, like Ed says, your own whole card, so to speak. You've got to check out yourself. But it, it is at a powerful time of emerging, and we're right in the center of it. I know you can feel it. You really can. And uh, all the elders that I know uh, around me, um, you could hear it in their voice and feel it in their heart, their heart. So it's just a... a Push yeah, yeah. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Hello? G Phil? Are you there, Tushka? I I can hear you. I'm here. Are you here? Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, let me see. How's that? Is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, I was just saying that I can... Uh, you guys there for a while? No, no, I, I was able to hear you. I don't know if you were able to hear me, but it's kind of been a weird day today. And uh, like everything, you know, uh, technology is, uh, you know, that, that grandmother spider that we all talked about um, can, uh, you know, come in and out too. And I, I totally agree with what you're saying, and I know um, that we all, every single one of us, have to look deep within. And uh, um, I just keep on remembering what the kugi said when they came uh, and they were at South Dakota and uh, how the temple of life is is broken and uh, people have to stop running and come into the prayer and uh, and I think that that's with all of us and uh, how important it is that uh, we can't run from what's happening and then the you know words that you've said over the years and then I then with Jane Goodall stuck in my head too about how we're really close and mm -hmm. and uh, how um, we all have to check in, and because we're all allowing all of it to happen, also um, because of uh, I don't I guess uh, we're all just I guess I can speak for myself. Just we're surviving right now, and it's hard to like take that extra mile. But if we don't, we're all gonna sink. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important for us to all step it up. And I like what you said that it's. Uh, because I've been hearing a lot, my wife's been saying it, and a lot of other folks about how we have to step into the the roles that was 
chosen that destiny for us mm-hmm. you know in this time and 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 it's all been spoken of i remember just when i was a young boy at five years old i had an elder because i'm from upstate new york aquasasini and and uh, i spoke with a gentleman that uh an elder mohawk that i didn't realize until i was from 47 when i was 40 i go oh he was talking about this and uh that he talked about we're going to be fighting for water in my adult life and you know we're going to see the fall of the united states of america and uh, i'm seeing all of it before me but he also about that we're going to come into this unity as 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 a people and, uh-huh. and we need to do do the work and we need to keep on um speaking up you know um yeah. and and sharing because i just don't want people to to react in an angry way and i know that it's 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 understood but it's like it doesn't it's not going to work but you can use the anger and 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 come out of it and do it in a way that's uh productive i guess for uh, you know lack of a better word instead of like cuz i know when i'm angry i don't make very good decisions that's right and so if i'm in my heart and that's where we all have to go and that's what uncle another uncle of mine told me he said if you can pray in your heart I won't worry about you anymore. And then, you know, uh-huh. you've talked about it over the years, you know, that longest journey is from your head to your heart, and that's where we all have to go. Uh-huh. And that's why I'm, like, I keep on putting this out there. You know, let's work together. Let's do this. Uh, um, of course, you know, we're we're humans, and we all get tired and things like that, but we, we can't stop now. You know, the dress rehearsal is over. I mean, we have to work together. Yes. Yes, and I think I think it's well... Toshka, if I might. Um, all human beings, every human being on this planet, all those that are going to be coming in the future, to Mother Earth and the Lord before us, every one of us is here for a purpose, and that is to grow spiritually. And we're all playing our role in this divine, uh, I guess they, they, I forget, there was, a, there was a play called something like the Divine Comedy. But this, uh, the, uh, the uh, traditions from India call it Maya, you know, the dance of consciousness. You know, that we all play our role, so to speak, that, that uh, uh, without, a, without a Judas, there couldn't have been a, the whole process that, that is the heart and center of Christianity. Or without a Stephen Harper um, playing his role, there couldn't have been this awakening that's happening between indigenous peoples standing up together with other members of the human family to halt this incredible destruction of the Alberta tar sands. So everybody's playing their role. Uh, everybody's doing the best they can. And that's why I think that, that once we recognize the oneness of humanity, comes with it really the, a tough job, and that is the removal of every form of I, whatever it is, you know, uh, of race, of nationality, of sexual orientation, uh, whether we're male or female, young or old, you know, all all of this, any prejudice, whatever that uh, causes it to feel better than or less than others, is, is part of the process we have to remove. So yes, you know, um, and also to recognize that the herd of one is a herd of all, and the honor of one is the honor of all, and that we're all in this together. I mean. Not any of us uh, is, is, how do I say it, uh, has any capacity to say, you know, we're not being affected by the sickness that's around us. We're immersed in it. We're part of it. And that's why the, the only way we can get it is healing our own self. And not by blaming others. That's tough. Because getting down inside your, your, your heart and getting down there and really digging out the debris collected there for generation upon generation upon generation, and cleaning that out and finding, reaching back and touching that divine, that sacred place in us where that unlimited um, love, compassion, and forgiveness and kindness comes from is not an easy task. Absolutely. And uh, Uncle, we got uh, Takaya is on the line with us, and uh, I just want to give her a chance to you know, introduce yourself, and I appreciate her calling. Uh, I believe you guys are both in the same part of the world. I don't know if you're traveling, Uncle. Yeah, she's a little bit north of me. Yeah, so... Good, good, good that you're here at Taco Shop. 
Are you are you there, Takaya? Yes. Oh hi, and uh, we'll give you the uh, floor to uh, introduce yourself. And thanks for uh, uh, calling in. I know everybody's busy, and I know it's a Father's Day, and we're all hopefully hanging out. But uh, I I believe that what we're talking about is very important, and uh, we definitely need to hear from the youth and uh, and what's on mm-hmm. your and what's on your heart uh, for us uh, as a people. We've been talking about how we're, we need to move forward. And uh, I'll give you that chance to mm-hmm. speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Takaya Blaney. I'm 13 years old, and I'm from the Slyman Nation. And uh, um, at a young age, I began to notice the cultural and environmental injustice that was happening around the world, uh, finding out through media as well as being a firsthand witness within my own community and seeing my culture, my ways of life, and part of who I am as an Indigenous person being ripped away from me. And it was, it was um, at the age of eight that I decided that you can only see so much. You can only hear so much. You can only experience so much injustice before you decide to actually be able to raise your fist in the air. But there is this moment where you, where you have to understand that it has gotten to the point, things have gotten to the point where the injustice includes you. Um, and so... I'm an environmentalist, I'm, I'm a speaker, I'm an activist. Um, some of the main issues that I've been recently fighting are uh, the Northern Gateway Pipeline. I've been fighting uh, extractive industries that undermine Indigenous rights. And I try and, and speak for Indigenous youth and address and assist Indigenous youth issues using cultural and traditional ways, trying to uh, to re-indigenize our current situation and educate the youth on what it is not only to be a cultural person, but to be a caretaker and a steward, a future caretaker and a steward, and a steward of the earth. Because we have gotten to a point in our, in our world where we are raising the youth without being uh, exposed to our environment, without being exposed to Mother Earth. We don't know what it is to drink the water. We don't know what it is to breathe the air. We don't love drinking water. We don't love breathing air because we aren't connected in that way. It's gotten to the point where it's not only what land will we leave for our children, but what children will we leave for our land. Um, So as an activist and as a youth, I recognize the importance of this generation now, the concept of generation now being uh, the generation that will change things, the generation that is of now, that will be uh, experiencing not only the aftermath of colonialism and the, the tragic events in the past, but we'll be experiencing a an almost revolution, which is what, as Indigenous people, as environmentalists, and as people who have just simply had enough, um, we are we are expecting. And you know, it's good. To, as an activist, I always advocate education, and I always act, uh, advocate advocate healing and especially advocate that education for the youth so they understand what their rights are, they understand what our earth our earth's rights are and so we can be prepared for things to intensify and we can be prepared for the world to be practically turned upside down. Um and so I don't uh I don't like uh I don't I don't typically go to a lot of marches and, well, nowadays I don't go to a lot of marches and rallies, even though I do find them very effective. Uh, I'd like to to um, to know not only what it is we are against, but what it is we are for. And so uh, as, as not only uh, an activist, but also like... Uh, since there's two types of activists, the warrior activists and then the activists who are looking at healing and doing the behind the scenes work. I try and focus more on the behind the scenes work um, nowadays because I believe that's where the most effective action is taken. Absolutely. Uh, Uncle, you still there? Still here. Yeah, and um, I think they're very important words. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to uh, touch base on what uh, was just said. Well, I, I think that, I think that uh, our Tucker Jaw here, our granddaughter here, is an incredible reflection of the the seventh generation 
I mean, really, she just articulated something that you can't, uh, I'll be 70 here in a couple of weeks. It's 70 years old, or almost 70 years old, that is more beautifully articulated than I could ever do. And that's what we want. That's what we want for our children. I've always said this, you know, my dad said it to me. He said, son, if you don't carry this journey on much further than me, I haven't been a very good father. And I know I haven't been a very good uncle or a very good father unless my children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and others that I take on in that kinship relationship, if they don't go way beyond me, way beyond me, I haven't done a good job. I haven't really been, because it, it, it's, it's like a relay race. And so I think here's a perfect reflection. I mean, just so articulate. At 13, yeah. where, where's our... Where's our Granddaughters and grandsons going to be 20 years from now. Be way, way out there. Way out there. And the thing is, is that the reason why I think that our, our, our granddaughter here can articulate this because of her mom and dad. So I'm going to wish her dad um, a happy father and her mother. Oh, I know both of them. They're just tremendous people. And those elders that mentored her. And that's what it's about. Because we're only here for a short time. It's time for these young people to stand up and take the place of leadership. In fact, I was just reading Alex White Plume's uh, note on Facebook. He was saying it's time to step back and let the younger generation step forward. And he says it's really hard. It is. We've got to step back and and let these young people. So that's my comment. I mean, I'm so pleased to hear what our our uh, our granddaughter has shared with us today. And she has so much more. I mean, not only that, not only can she speak, she can sing. She can compose the most beautiful songs. And she is a perfect reflection in her cultural dress and the way she carries herself of the way that our young people are becoming. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Aww. Thank you. <laughs> you deserve every bit and a lot more. Totally agree. And, 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 and just, uh, I just wanted to say this, Uncle, that, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, speaking to a few elders once and they said, yeah, we're going to step back, but they'll always be there. Like, you, yeah. I know you'll always be there. And uh, that's important for us to know in this culture because um, the Western culture, here in America at least, um, what, you know, there's a difference between old and elder. And so, mm -hmm. and so I want to just make that clear that you're an elder and that that we will always I, i'm grateful that we always have you for counsel and many others mm -hmm. and, and so um, mm -hmm. we we can only move forward um because i see the elders as the future because you're living in it and you know it and we're able to talk to you and but we ha we do have to step out and i think that's important and uh I'm trying to do more and more of it these days, but uh, you know I'm, I'm getting older myself. But I, I don't feel it. But I just know that I that uh, that I have to. I remember once uh, when my daughter first came; she's going to be nine this year, and I was always the person in the background. I would make sure everybody had water, did this, took care of them, made sure the elders were fine. And I knew that I had to get out. And I'm not really a great speaker, but I knew that uh, my kids they could see it from all the elders and stuff, but they didn't see it from me. It, w it wouldn't mean anything. And mm -hmm. so I, 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 I stepped up that way. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, it was once said that a, a community without children is, um, is doomed because they have no future and therefore they just, they just continue their existence. But I believe also it continues on to the elders because a community without elders is, uh, it's also doomed because those children have no mentors. They have no teachers. Even in this Western culture that we see today, teacher and mentor don't even mean the same thing anymore. Um, so when I when I talk about education um, and the importance of bringing the education to to the to the children, um, what I mean is we need we need the elders. We need the and we need our our teachers. And we need to be able able to to mentor these children in, in in two ways, not only in our cultural ways and continuing our morals, uh, continuing our ideas of caretakership and stewardship over ownership, 
but also we need to be um, we need to be taught about our rights legally, our rights as a community, uh, our Indian rights and title. We need to be taught these things because I was once told that before we turn the world around, we have to turn it upside down and we have to shake and shake and shake. And those people, uh, these these quote unquote leaders who are making false decisions on behalf of uh, a community that hasn't been informed, these people, they will fall off because they don't have any roots. They don't have a hand to hold. Um, they don't have love in their hearts. And we, we as youth, uh, we must be, we must be rooted in this way. And, um, we, uh, so we, we must have these, we must have these roots and we also, uh, yeah, we have to be able to, to connect in this way and things are only going to intensify in the near future. So we need to be taught of our rights, especially as we experience more and more injustice and the second and third waves of colonization towards our people, the corporate colonization towards our people. And, uh, we need to be, we need to be taught how to be, how to be proud and not just, not just proud of ourselves, but proud of, proud of our ancestors. And, you know, I, I have hope for, I have hope for these children. I have hope for this pride that, um, that we instill in them about teaching them about the ancestors, about having them sit in the knees of the elders and have the elders talk, talk to them about the creation stories. Um, because more and more you see the children reawakening. Uh, you see them, you see them bragging about their culture. You see them saying, oh, I know this much about my language, or I've been in a canoe this many times. And it's these people that are going to be the leaders of the movement because you have the elders and you have our decision makers and you have, um, and you have the true warriors for the people, uh, who are being a forefront in the environmental, cultural, and defense for the community movement. And these people, they've been at it for years and decades and they're getting tired and it's time for the youth to rise. And so it's so important and crucial that we understand how to heal, that we understand how to learn. And we must look to our elders as much as we look to our youth. Absolutely. And I know um, for us here in the Northwest, is, uh, we just, we've just we been losing quite a few elders and realizing that, um, you know, uh, I, um, Uncle Billy Frank Jr., who uh, I, I love dearly, and uh, he just crossed uh, not too long ago, and knowing that um the last couple of years that I've seen him I could tell that he was he was getting tired and that we need to step up me and another brother Robert Satayak and we're talking about that that we need to step up and that's all of us that we all have to step up in order for us to to make this shift cuz um I'm I'm hopeful that we can do that and I'm I'm continue to come in every week and to share what's on my heart uh, with our with our relatives, so we can move together in that mm-hmm. way. Mhm. Yeah. No. Well, we need to implement policies. We need to implement the the failed conflicts that have been failed through um, on the UN level and on the governmental level because massive organizations are looking to uh, the federal rural and provincial governments to implement these environmental and humanitarian and sustainable policies we have to look to those documents and we have to be able to implement these things on a grassroots level because it's just like a pyramid you have to go from the bottom up we have to have the base when we look to the movement when we look to um, effective change in a timely fashion we have to look to our neighbors the faces of change are often the faces of of your neighbors the faces of your aunties your uncles your families and we have to look to these people and we have to look to our entire community and be able to implement our policies, implement our change on this grassroots level and not just grassroots organizations, just all of the people who I've seen enough, who have heard enough, who have, who have cried enough for our future. And whether, 
and and whether our decision makers who are false representation of the people, whether they like it or not, they still are a representation of the people. And when you have people who rise in a wave of action who are going in one direction, these these leaders will be swept along with this wave because whether they like it or not, again, they are our representatives and they have to represent the voice, the voice of the people. And if this is the voice of the people, then they have to amplify it. They have to echo it. And we, we don't give them a choice at this point. So it's um, we don't have to go through 10 years of processing we don't have to go through, uh, we don't have to wait until the youth are, uh, are 40 years old. All we have to do is we have to understand, we have to be able to learn, we have to be able to listen, and we have to be able to, uh, to have the, the courage and uh, the, the drive to implement what we wish to see in the world. Because um, when, if you look to many popular environmental and cultural movements that are going on at this moment, they're rallying outside of uh, the rallying outside of buildings, uh, federal and provincial government buildings, and subconsciously, without really recognizing what we're doing, we're actually demanding action of the government, uh, and in contrast to demanding it of it of ourselves and that's that's a a mentality shift that has to happen we can't keep demanding action and holding up the signs we have to be able to look within ourselves and demand action of ourselves and that's when the world is going to change community by community and you know um dr john that my dad used to always if you dance with a drunk, you'll look like a drunk. And I think that would to me that if we try to to uh, dance with these systems that are disintegrating and, and dying or everywhere as prophesied, instead of you know standing in our strength, standing our spiritual values, moving towards the positive alternative we wish to create without giving away our energy fighting the negative, we're not going to go any place. So very, very, very profound thought there. You know, it, we need to, to said, um, come together and know that we, we are this move. We, we have to be the change we want to see. Very profound. Very deep. I, I want to just one other thing, uh, which I want to remember here for everybody. This 21st of June um, is coming before us. And uh, Chief Orville, uh, Chief Orville, and beloved partner Paul, and all the other ones who in New York on, on this World Peace and Prayer Day, which is being celebrated in the Ship Network and unified two groups that to really get to know who are active around the world. But also, uh, Chief Orville talks about protecting our sacred site. But I want to remind us that we are sacred. We have to protect and understand we are sacred beings. Like when I went to this grandmother, I'd been going to different ceremonies, various things. And uh, so she um, uh, asked me this question. She said, uh, you know, she said, Dr. Zhao, she said, Grandson, what is the most sacred ceremony you've ever been to? And I've been recounting all the Sundance and the Inikaka, you know, Sweat Lodge, and I've been to Chinook dances, and been up fasting, and all the various ceremonies, different places in the world. And kind of did, it was paying so a little bit of egotism there, like I really got to all these sacred ceremonies I knew was about. And she said to me so clearly, she looked right by, she said, you know, she said, I talked to Michelle, she said, those are all wonderfully sacred ceremonies. But the most sacred ceremony of all ceremonies is the birth of a child. Then she looked in my eyes really deeply and said, Then who are you? Then who are you? And I'll tell you what, now, that penetrated my heart. Not that all of a sudden I became enlightened at that moment, but it was something that made me realize if we're going to protect the sacred, 
this is a term that's being used a lot, protect and restore the sacred. It means also recognizing we're sacred and protect our sacred site and renew our sacred site within us. Like Black Elk said, you know, the center of the universe is everywhere. Everywhere. So I think that that is, um, is a day on the 21st. I know Chief Leonard George is having a special uh, uh, ceremony at Cape Park in North Vancouver. It's clearly to its nation. Many groups are meeting all over the world. So, you know, it's a, it's a good time uh, to find time, even if it's with yourself. To just and, and by this way, this should be every day. But on the 21st, this, this sacred day, all over the world, these four times of the year, solstices and equinoxes and so forth. This is the time to, um, you know, really, really take the next step forward within ourselves, in our own sacred site, and connect with that sacred, which is between all of us. So. Want to remember that, and that we can all join together in some way to to have that moment of quietness and that moment of prayer, that moment of of uh, really experiencing truly in our hearts the oneness of all life, of all people, of all things. Absolutely, and remember that everywhere is holy. Everywhere, Mother Earth, and uh, um, we sometimes forget that. And so we need to be in that prayer. It's so important for all of us. And we got about, I'd say, about seven more minutes. I just want to give you both a chance to, if uh, we haven't expressed what's in your heart and uh, with our relatives, if you'd like to do that. And again, I appreciate uh, you sharing this the last hour with us here um, on the airwaves here at KAOS 89.3 FM. And we're speaking with Chief Phil Lane Jr. and Takaya Blaney. And, uh, I I I know that my heart has been heavy, and uh, this has been really good for me to hear you both and uh, to share with uh, all of our relatives out there about um, where we're headed. And you know, I I hear what I hear is that uh, together, we got to do it together. Mhm. Um, I believe that. Um. Well. Usually I, uh, I end off any kind of uh, speaking engagement or, or, uh, or talk with, with these, these lines that, that, um, that empowered me and inspired me to become an activist and um, not, just, not just an activist, but a person who's involved and a person who's no longer willfully ignorant. As far as ignorance goes, I believe that there's two types of ignorance. There's the there's the pure ignorance where you have people who who truly are uneducated, and then you have the willful ignorance where people don't wish to to see certain things. Where people don't. It's kind of like when someone walks by a homeless person, they don't wish to make eye contact. When we willfully block things out of our minds, uh, and more importantly, out of our hearts, we don't feel inspired to become compassionate. We don't feel inspired to, to become active uh, due to that compassion and where compassion will take us. And so when I heard these words that my kupa, my grandfather, told me that ended my willful ignorance, they were, uh, you have a voice, um, you have a voice be heard, and you would always, you would always, my, 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 uh, my dad, they would always tell me that, you know, I have a voice and I just always heard that you have a voice to be heard, you have a gift, share it. And recently I realized that we have a responsibility. So let's work together. And this voice that we have, we have to speak for those who have no voice. We have to speak for those whose voice goes unheard. Because uh, I believe that the Creator gave us this responsibility for a reason. I was recently, uh, I was recently speaking with someone that I admire a lot, and he said that you can sign away your rights, but you can't sign away your responsibility. Uh, you can't ask for full uh, authority without, uh, without then asking for full accountability. And I believe that goes for anything in our lives as being human and being 
the caretakers and stewards of everything just on this earth, we will always have full responsibility because we all breathe the air, because we all drink the same water. We drink the same water from this worldwide well that we have. And when it comes to the pollution of our air, when it comes to the pollution of our waters, it won't matter who creed, it won't matter your race or or anything, um, any kind of any kind of wealth where you are in this world, because we all uh, we all breathe air, we all drink water, and and doing so is a universal need for all beings, and therefore we are all accountable, we are all responsible, and since we have a responsibility, it's in our best interest to work together. And so, uh, you know, we must remember to speak. Uh, even though it's an expression of how we think, sometimes we forget to speak sometimes. And it's really good to remember that, uh, you know, if if there wasn't a reason for our communication, if there wasn't a reason for our language and the morals and mentalities that are attached with it, the way of thought, then we wouldn't have it. And so especially in this time, especially in this generation now, you have a voice, be heard. You have, uh, and there is pride within everything as well. Even with um, what I tell the indigenous youth is that, or any, any person, there are people out there who will want to be you, who so remember that. And um, you, have a, you have a gift, you have a passion, share that gift and share that passion. Um, and let's be heard together. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uncle? Well, you know, again, Dr. Jha, you such an incredible job expressing yourself. So beautiful. I'm so proud to to, to uh, know you and your mom and dad and, and to be here in your territories up here in the... up here in... Uh, the Salish territories and other First Nations here. Just, I just want to quickly see if I can get this in real quick. You know, my grandfather, uh, Vine Deloria Sr., told me back around 1970, a meeting he had this elder who loved to, loved to learn new English words. He couldn't speak English very well. He spoke only Lakota, but he began hearing this word ecology. And of course, ecology is just a word that emerged in the late 60s, early 70s. And people never even knew the word ecology. So we asked him, say, Tanashi, he said, what is this word that Washicho and are talking about, ecology? What is that? He said, well, you know, he said, they, they have these big uh, places where people get educated and they learn how to, to read these words and they learn to write about what they read about and talk about what they write about. And then finally, after 18, 20 years, they get a piece of paper that says they're a doctor of life and they go to these big laboratories and... They pour other waters back and forth on Earth. He says, no, they discovered something very, very important. He says, well, what's that? We well, found out when you pollute the air, which all living things breathe, you pollute all living things. They pollute, when you pollute the water, which all living things drink, you pollute all living things. He said, what do you think about that? Oh, man, go, ha, ha. He said, I was wondering when they get around to that. I was wondering when they get around to that. He said, look what they do. They cut Mother Earth's hair where it shouldn't be cut. And they rip up her skin where it shouldn't be ripped up. Then they take and make holes inside of her and suck her blood out. And he turned to my, 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 uh, my grandfather and shook his finger and said, and what would happen if you did that to your mother? She'd die. And that's exactly what's going to happen if we don't begin to learn to respect our Mother Earth, which means to respect women who our Mother Earth represents ourselves. And so here we are. 1970, 2014, and look where we are. So I believe this is the turning point. We're here. The seventh generation has been right here on the phone with us. And so I, you know, if I have time for me to go today, tonight, whatever, I know the future is in good hands. Oh. Thank you. And thank I'm... you, Toshka. You have a great uh, people come and talk. And, and uh, thank you to Kaya again. And please wish your mom and dad my warm, loving greetings. And I want to remember Rebecca Tobias, who's done so much good work, and she's done not feeling well with her, but prayer too. Thank you. 
Yeah, and uh, thank you both for calling in, and I really appreciate it, and uh, have a beautiful evening. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right, we'll talk to you talk again. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can Thank you. you. Thanks. And uh, you've been listening to KOS 89.3 FM here in Olympia.